So the title of your book is Thinking Fast and Slow, and you talk about two systems, system one and two. Can you give us an example or uh, tell us a bit about uh, the characters in the book? Well, uh, the characters are indeed system one and system two, and system one is, you know, it's, it corresponds to a distinction that everybody recognizes. Uh, in their own thinking, that there are some thoughts that just happen to you and there are some thoughts that you must generate. Uh, there is a lot of, of mental life that is completely effortless and then there is some of mental life that feels like work. And uh, so that distinction is, is obvious and people recognize it. You know, when I say the word mother, you, uh, you have images probably of your mother and you certainly have an emotional reaction. And that's something that happens to you. When I say two plus two, a number comes to your mind. You didn't bring it there. It just came. It happened to you. So, and there are many, you know. In fact, most of mental life is like that. You know, the words that I utter when I say the sentence, they just come to me. You know, I don't. Uh, sometimes I will stop and choose which word. That's system two. But most of the time, you know, when I speak, the words just come. So that's system one. And a system two is, well, there are really two types of operation that system two performs. And one is complex computations. And that is where the pupil dilates. And, you know, there's, uh, this is mental work. So mental work uh, is involved in, you know, a, a short-term memory task. If I ask you, what is your what was your previous telephone number? You'll work. And your pupil will expand by about 30 or 40% of its area as you retrieve this. Uh, then there is self-control, the inhibition of uh, impulses. Uh, the, when you are indeed choosing your words carefully because you don't want to offend, or uh, those are situations in which system two is hard at work, and, you've, and you feel it. So it corresponds, system one and system two really correspond to uh, experiences that are readily available and that everybody recognizes. So that distinction between something happening and something that you do is, I think, pretty compelling to most people. The dichotomy that you've drawn between system one and two, um, how does that relate to the previous work you've done on heuristics and biases? Well. It turns out, uh, you know, we had, Amos Tversky and I, when we started our work, we had something in mind that was fairly similar to that. We were interested in intuitive statistics, so in, in you know, the estimates that come to people's minds about probabilities and so on. Now, in many of these cases, uh, we were both teachers of statistics. So we were testing our own intuitions, but we knew that we could compute. So in our very first paper, uh, we distinguish intuition from computation. And, and our point was that intuition is, in some cases, surprisingly error prone, and that people should uh, rely on computation. Uh, this, yeah. Uh, so that's. That was the beginning, but we never studied the system, what I now call system two. Then our work became controversial, and people uh, attacked it and criticized it. And there was something that essentially all the criticisms and all the experimental criticisms of our work had in common, in that they were created a situation in which people could figure out the answer by working on it. And uh, that was really the background. So Amos Tversky and I, in the very last paper that we wrote together, we answered one of our very persistent and well-known critics, Gerd Gigerenzer, and, um, and we pointed out that uh, in his experiments, typically uh, people would see, so, well, how would I describe it? One of our most, our best known examples in, in heuristics, and it's one of the best examples in the heuristics literature, is, is uh, the Linda example. So Linda is that young, 
not so young woman, she's about 30 years old now, and, uh, but I'm telling you that when she was a student, she was an activist, a feminist, marched in all the marches. I didn't say feminist, actually. And then uh, we asked people how likely it is that Linda now is a bank teller, or how likely it is that she is now a bank teller and is active in the feminist movement. Now, there's no question that when you ask different people those two questions, you know, they will invariably say that uh, it's more likely that she's a feminist bank teller rather than a bank teller. Yeah. When you ask them the two questions to compare the two options, you're allowing system two to check logic. And by priming logical reasoning and by creating some you can sensitize people so that they will detect that obviously she is more likely to be a bank teller than a feminist bank teller. But that seems to be a different process. When people see only one example, they evaluate the fit of that example. When you show them two things together, they can also compare them and you provide another cue. And that was really the background to the distinction between the two systems with a controversy around our work. Uh, it was an attempt to resolve that controversy by pointing out if you do it between subjects, in a, you know, if you do it the way the world is, uh, so you make judgments intuitively about things that they happen, you get those effects. And you can make them disappear by uh, allowing logic to, uh, to play. I've worked a lot with anchoring. You know, so that's a phenomenon. So somebody puts a number in your head, and and it looks plausible after a while. I mean, in fact, this is the way our mind works. We hear something strange. We try to make sense of it. Trying to make sense of it, it makes us more prone to believe it. So anchoring is is a suggestion effect that's very powerful. You can recognize when you're being anchored. So you know, if you are in a negotiation situation and the other side you know, has an outrageous number, uh, you know, there is, you could become anchored and that is worth resisting.